live on the internet. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for coming. I have no. I, I know there are there, there is at least somebody online. I know this is an open. So, hi Matt. <coughs> um, but uh, thanks for coming, Carl. Uh, graduated from the population biology group. Uh, 2012. 2012, all right, here in, um, and uh, is currently a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz, uh, working on fisheries, population dynamics, and management. But for our purposes here, one of the most important things is that Carl is one of the founders of the R Open Science Project, which he'll tell you a lot more about, but has had a lot of momentum over the past few years in building connections between users of data who uh, work through R and repositories of scientific data online that collect things together so that people can use them and also to provide uh, interfaces for people to get that information and also for people to get information to other people. And they've created a spectacular ecosystem of uh, R packages and associated <coughs> tools that let people do that interaction uh, to make it a lot easier to deal with these uh, online databases. So Carl will give you more details on that. Um, if you have your machine with me, we are um, setting this up so everyone should be able to just follow along. Um, there's actually- Where is Carl my screen, go, by the way? Carl will go into more uh, detail, um, but there'll be a, there's a, an online, uh, server of our studio running that has everything loaded already, so you'll all be able to just log in and, and do your thing. So you're welcome um, to just watch, but it'll be more fun if you follow along with me. Sorry, okay. I didn't get a pretty URL. So if you type this number, forget the rest of it, but type this ugly number, 107.170.225.143, you're going to find yourself um, seeing a screen like this. So then we can all kind of click along and see it works. Yeah, and those of you who are back. online, if you can't see something because of resolution or something isn't working, we, there should be a Q&A uh, dialogue at the link that I sent out, so you can post questions as we go as well, uh, and we'll see them here. Uh, so without further ado, thanks, Carl, and uh, take it away. Great, I'll do a more normal introduction in a moment, but I want to get you all signed in first, so we're all looking at the same thing. You all need usernames, so we're going to count around the room to come up with your username. So you're one. Your two, three, five, seven, eight, nine. So if you type user, I'll be user 10, and then you type your number, I'll be user 19, apparently. If you're online, you can grab the end of the alphabet, or, you know, not, there's 100 users, so put 95 or something. Um, and this should work. So your password and your name are the same. This is a temporary server, so this won't be up after, but all of the, you know, code will be able to run in our studio. Um, you may just have to install software. This means that all the software will be hopefully installed and we'll all be looking at the same thing. It works. So here we're in. That is very exciting. Okay, there's one more kind of startup step because I didn't put any data into here. We're going to go and start a new project. If you've used RStudio before, you know about this project button. Click new project. This is where we'll be doing our work. We're going to check it out from version control. Click version control, click git, holler if that went too fast. OK. Now you have to do something else. Go to github.com slash r from sci. This is the first repo you'll see there. It's the repository for our workshop. So you, after this is over, this will always be here. You can go and grab any of these files and pull them down if you want to play with them. So even though that instance on the computer will die, this will be here. Questions? Yeah, sorry. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, from there, if you're at the login screen, it's user, just the word user all lowercase, and then your number. And the password is the same as the username. Anyone else trying to log in? Great. If you have, you're trying to log in. Uh, oh no, sorry, I'm logged in. You logged in. in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it has as everyone found this page on the internet, github.com slash r open sci. I'll, I'll just back up a step so you can see. So, 
I don't know if you're logged in or not. You should see some page that looks like this, and I'm just going to click on the first one that says Workshops Davis 2015 L1. So we're going to paste this thing. This we just need this address that's here. If if you don't want to do that, you can just kind of type. But this is going to avoid typing. So if you were here, I know how to use. You're just pasting that in. So that just says https colon slash slash github.com slash arp and slash slash a lot of typing if you're typing workshops dash davis dash 2015 dash 01 dot git. This is the worst part of the day, believe me. Project. Yep, create project. I'm just going to circle so that we're on that. That's why. <laughs> this is where all of our stuff will be. And then So just paste, the word, I mean, yeah, it's we're going to paste that address here, and now, we're, now you have the same data that we have. Yeah. You're good? Your neighbor's good? OK, great. Awesome. So we've done all the hard spot stuff, except I need to make this bigger because nobody, including me, can see it. Um, what's the? Uh, use the use the R Studio interface to do it. Yeah. Uh, if you, what is it under? Uh, okay, command plus. That's all we said, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good enough. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm now going to give you some slides to kind of introduce everything. If you want to follow along in these slides, you can. You don't have to. They'll be up here, hopefully. So I just want to give a little introduction to the RF Inside project itself. So we're going to be talking a lot about software that has been built by the project, but I wanted to tell you what the project is. The project has a couple of full-time people, but it is mostly a community open source effort. Um, so that means that there are contributors from all over the globe. Um, many of them are practicing scientists, um, PhD students, postdocs, faculty, also people in the industry that have an interest in what we're trying to do and they can contribute, and you can contribute too. So what does that look like? Well, the project is an assembly of contributed packages. We'll be using some of these packages. If you want to get a quick snapshot of what exists, you can go, this is just um, an embedded little thing, but if you go to status.rfinside.org, you'll see this. And these are kind of the a dashboard of the current projects. So you can see whether they are far along in development. They'll be on CRAN already, the R archive. Uh, ones that are still being built, not yet on CRAN. You can see when it has last been changed. You can see current issues, how many contributors. We can kind of sort by some of these things too. So I think my slides are interactive. So you can say, you know, some of these projects will be using tax size a bunch with 11 different people that have contributed to it. You can see that it's popular on GitHub and it's been downloaded on the, the people a lot. So anyway, this is just a big snapshot of all the mess that is our open side. Where does all of these packages come from? Well, that comes from our open source development. Uh, so, which comes from our community. So this is just, again, a little page about our people. You can see this at the our open side of our website. But there are lots of people that I was just describing um, that are graduate mm -hmm. students, postdocs, and so forth, faculty, and uh, members in other ways, like Martin is with Floss. And these people have all decided this sounds interesting. I want to learn more about it. Many of them are not necessarily deep R programmers to begin with, but they're interested in learning how to write a package that interfaces 
with a database and connect that data to your computer. And so the project kind of helps coach people along on how to do that, what our standards are, what standards you need to meet for a package to get up onto CRAN and make that happen. And by building a community, you have a place to learn, you have a place to get help, and you have people to kind of help move your code along. So many of the packages are not developed just by one person sitting in their office writing away, but by anyone else who sees that he's interested. So project is about people, ways that we connect with people. Uh, you can find out kind of big picture of things that are going on with the project at the blog. So here we announce updates where we've gotten some Sloan funding over the past two years, which have paid for some of our core positions. Um, we have community calls. This is a relatively new thing. These are every six weeks. This is just a chance to kind of see what's new with the project, hear what people are doing. You can go and see the agenda for the next upcoming call at that address. They're also webcast. Our community is online and global, so we're forced into these asynchronous uh, workflows quite often. But we also try to get together in person. So coming up is an unconference that we're currently kind of limited on our total capacity. But you can look at the website, see what uh, is, is there, what kind of things we'll be discussing. This is a chance to kind of bring in members of the community, again, from all over the globe, meet in San Francisco in person and talk about our open side. If you're interested or excited, we do have applications for some of the limited spots there. The day-to-day -day action is mostly on GitHub and Twitter. So feel free to tweet at us, follow the account to see new things that are happening at RFNSI, or go to GitHub to kind of see the day-to-day the -day commits and changes in the project. So overall, we're trying to work across that whole spectrum of what it means to be an open source project. So the big picture goal is to increase the availability and quality of our packages that are interfacing with research data, all kinds of data. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. Um, we are also interested in doing this in a particular way. So we have a strong commitment to reproducibility. Uh, we want people not only to kind of get access to their data, but access it in a way that someone else can now reproduce the analysis from start to finish, from getting the data to producing that final publication, publishing data, publishing the papers, publishing the figures that go with it, and track that whole pipeline in R. Uh, we want the software that we're creating to be sustainable as well. This means that as we move forward, the web is always changing. These packages interface with the web. They need to be maintained. They need to be tested. Uh, eventually, if a source of data is removed, they need to be deprecated. So having a community looking out on the packages, testing them, and using them helps kind of guide the packages through that process. We also try to enforce certain uh, software development standards like good testing and automated tests to make sure that we catch any breaks before they're going out to the users. You know, we always depend on the users as well to find bugs, but automated testing is kind of the first defense. So that's all for the goals of the kind of project overall. Talk a little bit just about the setting the scene here. So we have data coming from all new sources. You're probably sick of hearing this, but there's remote sensing data. We have micro sensing data. We can put on little uh, animals and follow their movements. We have big observatory efforts like NEON in ecology and in ocean sciences, the Ocean Observatory Initiative. That's a $1.4 billion initiative to monitor basically everything that you can in the ocean. There is much greater computer power every year uh, that is driving new kinds of data that come from simulations, for instance, and climate models. That's quite big. And of course, there will always be the importance of field-based study in all kinds. So from a climate example, getting ice cores, the kind of hard won but very valuable data. You can look at this forecast in the future and see that What's happening to our world is that you know, data is growing exponentially. And the important thing about this little figure um, I've taken from this paper in Science in 2011 was that this is not historical. This is a forecast of what's going to happen. This means that this is like where we're, we're here, right, 2015. If we've got this much data, and we're drawing our anything that we're publishing, you know, at best is based on on this. We're talking about a future over here. How do we do science today? you know, analyzing only this tiny little smidgen of the world of data that is relevant when we have all the data in the future. That's the kind of reason to build these pipelines that you can set up your analysis and say the data no longer comes from just what I've collected already, but it comes from where this world of the internet of people solely uploading databases and maybe giving us much farther back views in history and developing new data sources. 
And my project now, if I do the analysis today, well, in 20 years, I can rerun those pipelines and pull on this much greater world of data. So anyway, that's kind of the motivation there. So let's now dive in and do some R coding to see what that looks like. So I'm going to show kind of several examples of the different packages we've written that interface with different little slippets of that uh, kind of available <coughs> open online data. First one will all be examples from taxonomy. Um, so this is, we all started as ecologists, so there's an ecological flavor here. We're still mostly in environmental science and ecological data. Arkansas now has some social science data, and we're looking for more contributors in that area. So don't let that phase you. But we're going to start here with taxonomy. So just a quick introduction to why we're doing taxonomy. I have about two slides here. So the central package we're going to be talking about is called TaxSize. And this is assembling about 20 different online resources that allow you to compute on taxonomic information. Um, so we're going to look at some of these different functions. Most ecological and evolutionary studies start with species. And in order, before we can start comparing results, we need to make sure that what I've called a particular species is the same thing that someone else has called that. Otherwise, we can't synthesize that data. So who, who has worked with species data before? They've had species names in their data sets. Great. So this is not completely foreign. We're going to go and do some of that. So let's start here. If you, I don't know if you saw my directory, but you see, if you had just cloned it, you're looking at these four little lessons. Click on the taxonomy lesson. And then let's start on use case one. So just click this tax size use case one dot RMD. And that will open up here. It's going to give people a moment to do that. So to run this example, the first thing we're going to do is load the library. You can just put your mouse over this section here and click Run. And you now have the library loaded. If you were doing this at home, you'd want to install that package first from CRAN. All right, so like any good study, we start with a list of species. One of the first problems with species names is that we record them in notebooks. We, people have different ways of writing them. Sometimes we've just made typos. Sometimes these are really just different ways of saying the same Latin name. So here's a list of species, but many of these are not quite right. So I'm just going to load that into R. If I'm going too fast, you're still trying to open that RMD file, uh, wave your hand, and Noah will we'll see what he can do. If you just go over the, you're going to run this whole this whole block, right? So you can also just if you're clicking through, you can do this by running chunks. You can say run current chunk, and it'll give you a shortcut there. So that that should be in there. If you click down on your console, you should be able to write species list s p list. You can see that we have a list of species names. And so our first question is, you know, are these good species names that we're, you know, ready to do science with, or do we need to go and correct them? So we're going to look up against some of the existing databases and see, well, what name is in the database? So this is going to do kind of a spell check, if you will, for species names. So here we're using a particular, there are several different databases, like there's about 20. This one is using the TNRS list from the iPlant project. So these are all species of plants. Um, you can see there's different name resolution services for different groups of species. So now the package is going online. It's going to tell us up. We're going to go search for this, so we'll wait for a moment. And then we've now got our data. We're going to do some cleaning up here. So this is going to it gives us lots of information back. This is just some standard R code to uh, drop some of that information. And let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. 
That's right. And so you'll see that it's given you, and here's all of the, some of the information we've gotten back. There's a match score. So you can say, well, this one is a perfect match. We had the right name. Other ones of these, no, what you submitted wasn't quite right. You had Pinus with an O, and it matches Pinus with a U um, against this source ID. And so now we have the corrected species name. It also gives us more details, like the authority from which they have decided this is the right species name. So we can now say, great, we got that whole data frame back. Let's just take the accepted name as our name from now on. So I'll run that little piece. Great, now we have the spell corrected names. So this is just another example. This is pushing against the Encyclopedia of Life instead of the plant service. So if you dig into the package documentation, we'll tell you more about these different sources. But here we're querying for a whole bunch of sources using the global names as all of our starters from EOL. So it's much bigger taxonomically. It's not just plants. Um, and we can see we can get the same corrections and the same names here. So you can just go ahead and run that whole chunk. And it gives us our species names. Because names differ by different authorities, you may choose to work instead in terms of uh, what we call taxonomic IDs. This is the way the most of the databases work. So rather than saying like, oh, well, this is my species name, most people don't say, this is my species name and it's consistent with EOL's definition of the species name, which by the way, for certain species is different than iPlant's definition. This, this all can get very confusing very quickly. So while it's useful, of course, to provide the species name to researchers for whom that's a meaningful piece of data, you may also manipulate the taxa by their ID. So this, unlike species names, which change over time as we learn more about taxonomy, the taxonomic ID is a fixed identifier. And so we treat that the way when we're moving things around and uh, manipulating data by species, we want to use and merge based on that ID. And we'll avoid the fact that, oh, well, so-and-so calls this this species and so-and-so calls it that species. We say, you know, this is a TNRS ID and everybody agrees on what that means even if they don't agree on, you know, what this mimulus bicolor species is. They're revising the classification of monkey flowers. So here is a quick example of what it looks like to get identifiers. Uh, so I've gone over to the identifiers file, open that up. When I say here, I've just given it one species name, and I've asked it for identifiers from these various sources of reference. So again, you can just run that. And it's going to go and query the given species against each of the given sources. And you get back a note that tells us there are more than one particular match here. So it's worth thinking about the, uh, the details. Um, so it says here, it gives us kind of these two matches. And you see they have, they have different IDs. Um, and this one has been noted as being accepted. So if it's gone and used the default key, now it says, ah, oh, look, well, your species matches all these different identifiers because there are lots of different, different varieties. And so you can choose that kind of top level identifier to say, I mean, all of them according to uh, this database, the ITIS, or no, I mean, you know, I'm only talking about this particular one. So I can use this ID. So identifiers allow you to be more precise. The package allows you to interface with the identifiers. There, I didn't pick any one of the particular ones, so it says you didn't pick one. Okay. I'll do one more example in taxonomy. I can scroll. So you can also, once you can query taxonomic information, you can look up the rest of the taxonomic classification. For instance, you might be interested in the common names, or you're interested in 
you have a genus and you want to know all the species in that genus. So this is an example with common names. Here I'm giving it a list of species. Same list that we were working with from before. I'm going to go run current chunk. And now we're going to use this scientific to common name function, sci to com, based on a particular database, the ITIS. There are actually many different common names for the same species. So simplify equals true is just saying, well, just give me the most popular one, the first one in the hits. Um, otherwise, we may go and look through and see how many different common names we could get from each one. So common names are even less standardized than taxonomy. So you can actually see how many different ones we were getting here, I think. So let's go down here and run. So we've got four different common names for this guy, four common names, these ones only have one common name. You can look at that vector if you want. You can just say what were the common names. You can see it's giving you the multiple common names. So again, that can be handy when working with taxonomy. All right, I want to forge ahead to a kind of different example. So that is not data that you would compute with necessarily, but more of a way to clean up your data. And the package is providing you a way to do that across a suite of different databases, rather than a more manual approach where you'd have to go to each one individually uh, and say, look up what ITIS says on its website. Because you're doing it in this R code, everything that you've done to clean up your data is now scriptable. So the next person can run the same thing. If you get new, new species lists um, that you've added to your study, you can just rerun the functions, and they'll correct those names and get their ID numbers as well. So a very different example we're going to do now in biodiversity data. So one of the most common things we can start getting out of ecological data as people report that they've gone out and found this particular species at this location is being able to study species distribution and occurrences. So there's lots of different databases online in ecology that now are starting to collect that data. We have a package that's going to help synthesize but you can interact with any one of those. Like, say you want to interact with GBIF, one of the very large ones from the exam data. You can use the RGBIF package. But to make it a bit easier when you're working across many different databases, there's a new package we have that, kind of like tax size, grabs all the different databases. And that package is called SPOC, so Species Occurrence. So we're going to go and take a look at this Species Occurrence file and show some things you might be able to do with that. So as before, load the library. And then let's just run this whole current chunk. So as I was mentioning, we're going to look for this species of hawk. We can say I'm only interested in museum records that are stored in GBIF. And if I then, after I run this function, it says, oh, well, there will be records for GBIF. We'll look at those in a moment. But other things like eBird, which is another one of the databases, um, since we didn't list it in our little from list, we don't have any data here. So we get back this big object with lots of different data from each one of the different databases that we listed in our from category here. Each one also has a set of metadata that describes what's going on with that. So let's, let's just take a quick look at metadata associated with the GBIF returns. This is a, a big R list, and it tells us that we've limited our returns to 500. So we've only got the first 500 hits that were searched for this particular scientific name. And we're looking for all fields in GBIF. If we want to see what those fields are, we can take a quick look at head of the GBIF data for the first species or not. That would help if I spelled correctly. So there by species name there. And you can see that there are lots of different fields, for many of which the GBIF records know nothing about. 
such as the elevation accuracy or the water body or the, the record number. The most common pieces that are in there are always going to be the latitude and longitude um, and the species name. So to help you kind of clean up the data, because these get these sort of big ugly R lists, which you may not want to work with, even if you're used to cleaning up data in R a lot, this is kind of a little quick function that will tidy up that data. Here I'm also going to query from eBird just for fun to make the data more complicated. So this OCC to data frame will convert the output from this occurrence data into a data frame with the most common categories. And so now if I look at it, look at head, here's a much more tidy data frame that we were just looking at with what data was able to find that was common across both databases. So it tells me if it was from GBIF or if it was from the eBird database. I get a latitude and longitude, and I get the species names. Had I given a list of species, that would differ for each species. So we have been able to do a sample a very large data set very quickly. Uh, that matches our search criteria. What can we do with that kind of data set? Well, now there's, of course, a rich world of R packages for working with occurrence data. Just to give one example here, I'll map the occurrence data using uh, a ggplot. And so now you have a species distribution map put over a Google map of the occurrence where it occurs with dots where each one of the species are. We can get more fancy using JavaScript. This one's going to ask for a GitHub login, which I might have to have no one logging in for. Anyway, I'll not demonstrate that one right now. So if I wanted to have the same map, but such that I can zoom on it. I'm going to go back to files now. And we'll do one more. Oh, again, I think so. yeah, I to do one more. Do that. I just did show digging into a little bit more of species occurrence modeling, combining it with other sources of data. So here, I'm going to use just the RGBIF data, but return some richer fields. And then I'm going to couple this with uh, Robert Hardman's, uh, who's in this department's Dismo for distribution modeling, and then some map tools to plot these maps. So if that went too fast, we're in RGBIF use case one, the RMD. That's loaded the libraries. So we have to do some cleaning up. So we're going to pull some of the data that is coming right out of the Dismo package. This comes from that the vignette in that package. If you've worked with species distribution modeling, you may have been familiar with this particular example. And we're going to combine that with, uh, oh, we need some some data on the global boundaries, get a map of the world. And now we're going to combine that with a lookup for this particular species. So we give it a query. We say it's at the species level. Give us 60 points from RGBIF. So we can take a quick look at what it gives us. So it gives us back this data frame with the species, um, some extra metadata about it, and the occurrence maps. I'm going to use these keys from that to search for occurrences. And then I'm just going to convert it into a little data frame. Now I have uh, generated, based on looking at where the occurrence species has occurred, and then those climate layers that I pulled in that tell me things about, say, the average rainfall in that area, uh, the species distribution modeling is going to say, oh, it looks like this species likes rainy areas. Well, I know a lot about where rain falls in the rest of the globe, so I can predict you know, where this species is most likely to be found based on where you have preserved it. So we're going to first put our predictors onto our map. This gives us the environmental gradient over the part of the world we're looking at um, based on how much rain falls there. We're going to add some simple lines for countries just so that it looks pretty. And now we can put the distribution of the observed points on the map. So we can dive in a bit further on this example using the vignette that is published with the Dismo package. It already provides the occurrence data for this uh, to show this example. Here, we've shown how you can now 
pull in any occurrence data from RGBIF and not just the sort of prepackaged occurrence data that comes with the, with the example and generate a very similar plot. All right. Back to files. I'm going to skip over Earth Science demonstrations just in case you're wondering what's in here. There's two examples. There's a sea ice example on world climate uh, data from the World Bank. So looking at um, the, the model projections that are coming out of different IPCC models or looking at for, for a variety of climate variables. And just kind of, but the basic workflow is the same. So I think I will bore you too much if you see me just clicking through examples without getting into enough detail to understand what they're doing. So instead, we're going to kind of shift gears here and look at what you can do. This has all been data that we've been pulling down from the web, how you can kind of provide some of these manipulations on your own data and <coughs> in using kind of much smaller, more heterogeneous data um, that is also very common with field work. So. I might have to compile this. Okay. So the basic idea was start with email example. If you're pulled in a particular source of data, maybe it's from one or from several of these different examples, as uh, we've illustrated here. Let's start with the one that we just did with species occurrence data from GBIF and uh, the eBird database. So this looks like a data frame you might have in your own research because we have pulled these from particular resources. We know what GBIF and eBird mean, and we know that these are referring to occurrences. But if we were to provide somebody else with this data, they might say, OK, well, I can kind of guess what's there, but you haven't provided me a very full description. If someone else has gone out and done different research on another species that they're interested in also looking at occurrence modeling for, they may also have recorded the same information, but they may have put it into a table in a different way. So maybe they have called this, instead of longitude, they've called it long, and instead of latitude, they've called it lat, right? And so as soon as you do something as simple as that, it's already impossible for a computer to know that those two are the same thing, and it can put those two in the same columns. So there is a set of packages we'll be looking at now, which are providing a way to describe your data, whether it's you know, data we pulled down or whether it's data you've entered by hand, in a way that a machine can understand what you mean. That this is longitude and that is latitude. And that's going to allow both other people to discover what you have in that particular repository, and it allows you to kind of combine data sets then. So in order to do that, we have to generate a description of the data. And so here we'll do kind of a, we're going to load this library EML, which is one way to kind of formalize what going on in our columns and rows. So we'll load that library. We'll load the species occurrence library. I've already run this for you, but we'll run this. The first thing it gives us is a way to define just what those column names are in with a bit more verbiage. This scientific name or database from which record was obtained makes a pretty ugly handle for a column in R. So you tend to call it something short like PROV. But someone looking at the title PRV, prov, what does that mean, might have no idea what that is. So we can separate the kind of convenient form from the column definition where we can describe in, in full detail what we're talking about. So here I've just provided a column vector of characters. The other thing that we need to be able to combine data is understanding what units the data are in. So If our latitudes and longitudes were measured in degree, minutes, and seconds instead of decimal degrees, we couldn't treat them the same way. We're treating values in degrees. So here I've tried to kind of specify what's going on. The first, the first column, it's a character string, and it's just providing a scientific name. The second one is a unit of degrees. It has a particular precision, so don't believe decimals after a certain point. 
and optionally you can specify the bound so that you can identify outlier data, um, anything that's not within that, that bound, it's probably not a good entry. Um, so longitudes and latitudes. And finally, we can have, we have this factor that says either it's GBIF or eBird, so we can specify what that means with a bit more verbiage so that other people who aren't familiar with our acronyms know what we're talking about. GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I'm going to link there for people to learn exactly what that is. eBird comes from the Cornell Ornithology Lab. It's an electronic bird database for crowdsourced information about bird occurrences. And there's their website. So, a little bit of verbiage. Now we're going to generate, using this email package, just a machine readable version of all of that information. This uses a metadata standard, so the ecological metadata standard, which represents all of its stuff in XML. The nice thing about that is, well, it looks like an ugly file to a human, but it looks like a very readable file to a computer. And because it's a standard, it doesn't matter that we've worked in R, and like our collaborators might be using other languages, might be in Python, might be in Excel, might be using a web browser, and know nothing about these languages. The standard can be understood by any one of those things. So if we were just to save our data as an R object, well, it would be great for our users. You know, they can run through the code, they can get all of the same things we were looking at. But if anyone wasn't using R, they're out of luck. So by entering the data in the metadata standard, now everybody can read it. So this function will generate that. I actually have to go and run these code chunks before we're ready to run it. And this is providing a very kind of minimal description with just these column chunks. Um, definitions and unit definitions. And it says, in order to be a valid file, it's just one more extra piece of information. It wants to know who to contact. So if you're looking at this data file and you're like, I have no idea what's going on there, if nothing else, you have the email of the creator. On the other hand, if you want to provide much richer information, we can also say things about sort of let's have a description of the geographic range that the data is coming from or the range of uh, over time that we have measured this, the kind of temporal window or the last piece that's commonly reported is the taxonomic groups that are there. So anyone who is now searching for this data can say, I want all data that has this particular taxonomic group. So I haven't put that in here to keep this example minimal. All right, so now we can see if we can generate this standard. So it's generated this XML file for us. Now working directory, wherever that is. And we can check that all of the uh, other software that understands the standard can read it by validating the file. So when you have a CSV file, you're like, oh, this looks good. Like other things should at least be able to read it into their computer, but they'll may have no idea what's what. So by validating this, it says that not only is our data there, but our metadata is valid. So we'll find out. It's going to run a series of different tests, and it comes back. Both of them are valid. So this is great. This is a portable file that can go anywhere. We can take a quick look at what these, what this looks like when you put it into a repository. Um, so unlike the repositories that we've been working with so far, like that species occurrence data repository, that is vertically integrated, meaning that if you want to give them data, they're going to throw out basically everything you did in the study except for the species name and the latitude and longitude of where that was from. So that little bit of data might be useful to somebody else in occurrence modeling, but 99% you know, of the work that you've done is irrelevant. So when we annotated our data this way, rather than throwing out all the stuff that's relevant, we we're going to publish the whole data file, but provide just the metadata so that's uh, in addition that someone who wants to do, say, looking at species occurrence can get that. But if it looks weird and the numbers aren't right, they're not just like, oh, where did this stuff come from? They can drill down and find the whole context of the data. Uh, so this KNB is a repository that, instead of being vertically integrated, where all the pieces have to fit together, it uses these metadata files. So let's take a quick look at some of the data that is in this, this database. Question? Yeah. On what you were doing before, you said the, the purpose is to be able to join it across different. That's fields, right. right. So when you do that validation, are those fields like the latitude and longitude? Is it validating that those are the same? 
it gets a little bit more tricky if we want everything to be completely automated. So it's validating that it's described according to the standard. Okay. So the standard is not what we call semantic, meaning that it knows the, the conceptual definitions of what a latitude and a longitude are. Right? It just knows that there needs to be a column description. So we can, once we have that piece, we can now teach the standard to be semantic, which is that what it needs to do to say, when you say latitude and when you say latitude, they're the same thing. Or when you say Jaguar and you say Jaguar, you're both talking about a species and not a car. Right? But to teach a computer the, different, the, the meaning of the term Jaguar, uh, oh, I mean it as a species name, and someone else is using a description of a car, we need to add that kind of extra layer. So we can do that in here. But right now, that has just relied on it being described. It doesn't but not being interpreted. So it's, a, it's really the first step to do that. So anything that we're describing up at the top level, though, has, uh, so we say this is the overall description of the, the temporal range of that data or the species coverage of that data. Well, it knows that's the species coverage. Whereas if it's just, this is the column saying species name, it just knows that you've labeled the column well. So we can, once we have submitted that XML file to a, place like the KMB here, and we can say, oh, show me all other data files that have that particular attribute. So um, have a taxon. People don't study humans very often. So to show you what one of those files that we just created looks like. So there is a data file that's in Excel that's like, here is the raw data. But if we want to know what all of that means, there is who to contact, there's the geographic region that it would cover. So it gives us a bounding box and shows you what the bounding box is. And there's a temporal range at which they've covered it. And there's a taxonomic range. So you can say, maybe let's steal one of their taxonomies and see I don't know how to copy and paste on a Mac if there is any more data in the database for that particular taxonomy. Okay, sorry, I picked a bad one. So that's our only match for that. Why well, you should prepare your examples first. Okay, so this is just providing you a description of how to, of, of the data that's in your database there. Um, the last thing we'll demonstrate with this, because I've got seven minutes, is pushing this up to a particular repository. So we could push this to the KNB, or um, here I'm going to illustrate an example uh, with Figshare, just because it'll let me show the Figshare repository, which is slightly more generic. It's not just providing ecological data. So you say, now I've prepared a good metadata description for the file. I have my data. I want to capture that kind of whole pipeline that I've spent all this time kind of cleaning up and getting that data ready to go. I could just say, you know, oh, I got my data from these couple sources, and uh, here is some R code, and here are our final results. That doesn't provide a very quick line of entry for anyone else that wants to dig deeper into your results. So we encourage people to publish the kind of final cleaned up data that you're running your analyses on. Um, and so this function is going to publish both the EML file along with the, the raw data as a CSV file. And it's going to push it to, to Figshare. In order for this to work, we have to create a log on, on Figshare. So you have to have an account. So if you already have an account, and actually if you're running this out uh, on a RStudio desktop, not in this little server thing, this will just work. It'll just ask you to do a little verify um, but if you don't already have an account, you'll have to create one. We're going to do that now. Yeah. So the, the XML and uh, the data files stay separate? They're separate files? They're separate files. The XML knows about everything, so it knows that there's a data file and knows, or maybe that there are 10 different CSV files, oh. and it will have pointers to what their names are and where they are. So I have to figure out where I put that XML file if you want to see what that looks like. So. It's in our current working directory. So this is what XML looks like. It looks a lot like HTML, if you've seen it before. 
has some basic metadata that's automatically generated. So we're publishing the data. The data has Creative Commons zero rights by default. And then you know, it's the date that we published it and so forth. And there are numeric identifiers that just help a computer know that it can refer to just a little piece of this if we're not using the whole thing. Um, if we're not a computer, we don't care about it. It describes some details like this is a CSV file. Well, people define CSV files differently in R. You know, there's CSV and CSV2. So it says exactly what kind of CSV file we're talking about. Delimiters are commas, not tabs. There's this kind of character ending. So it's calculated all that automatically because it's being generated by R. So if you were to prepare this by hand, you would have to be entering in each of these things one by one. It gets tedious really quickly. So that's why it's nice to have a computer generate your metadata for you. If you work on the same species all the time and you're trying to provide a description of like each of your field sites, it's great to have that you know, the first time in a nice kind of web interface. But after you're being asked to do that 100 times, it's much easier to have a piece of code to say, oh, grab you know, my usual sites and the species that are involved in it. And so here is the definitions of these columns, units, and degrees, and whatever. So that's what the computer is reading. Uh, a, a human being wouldn't want to look at this. Here is a, it said, it's written out the CSV file. It's given a unique identifier. And so it refers to a dot csv file there you know, we could go ahead and open that up so here it's written this data out of r and into a into a csv file and there it is and so it's going to go and upload both pieces of that all right so to do that we have to go to figshare we'll find out if no one's already logged in here or not Mm -hmm. okay. Sign up. You need to create a name, user, blah, blah. Anyway, I don't know how much. Do you have a logged in account so that? Actually, I can log. Well, maybe I can. I can log in since you're not logged in. That should be easy enough. If you already have an account, you can log in. And if I was on a local R Studio, then that would be all I have to do because we're on this, the web server we're running in here is kind of in a lockdown box. So it's not going to let me authenticate automatically just because I've locked it down for security. So we need to kind of go and pass it these, these keys. So this is, makes this look a bit more complicated than it would be. So you go to your user, you go applications, and we can get the keys manually rather than having the computer get them for us. And so, well, you can create a new application if you don't have any, so applications. Create new application. You can call this email. This doesn't really matter. And now I can review my email application and get these codes. So you're going to copy each of these codes, which is a little tedious. Now I just have to place them through. So again, this is only a, a, a problem of being locked in the box. So we provide this kind of crude workaround for you.
And it will ask if you want to case the credentials so you don't have to do this in the future. We'll do that. So it's great. You're authenticated. Now we can go ahead and publish files. Sorry, I didn't test that with my new application yet. Yeah, well, it carries what I, if I spelled it, however I spelled it there. So. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I have a failed example here because I didn't test it. So this email package is one of the newer things. So this one's not actually up on CRAN yet. If we want to have Limo on CRAN as a way to publish to more databases than FigShare because while it's a very generic one, um, it doesn't the FigShare itself doesn't know how to read all of that XML, whereas KMD does. So for this particular describing things in this ecological metadata language, we would want to push it to can be where it can make use of all of that uh, sort of rich annotation. There is more and more of these kinds of databases coming online. So within phylogenetics, for instance, there's a different kind of description um, that lets you provide all this information. Um, it answers the question that you said, where it is properly semantic. So you can automatically do the synthesis of the different data frames. So if you have a phylogenetic tree, for instance, uh, you can describe in this language not called EML, but called MEXML. And there's a package that will do that. So, sorry, I didn't put that demonstration in there. But then you're publishing to a repository like TreeBase that speaks that language. And it says, oh, good, now I figure out these are all the different taxonomic names, taxonomic identifiers. This is the genetic data that was used to generate the phylogenetic tree and so forth. So, this is just hopefully trying to give a flavor. It's not all just about the big databases that already exist, but about making your data be able to kind of play within that same ecosystem. All right, so I'm a bit over time already, so I'll stop and see if there are some questions. Yeah. So it'll depend on the function. So we can take a look at um, the species occurrence data, for instance. So let's go back to our little example here. Some, if I'm using like the RGBIF example, this search will always be searching against the R, R, the GBIF database, right? So I don't have to have to worry. When I go into this uh, Spock example, you say, uh, here, what's the default for the OCCs from groups? So let's make this a little bit bigger so you can see it here. And you see that by default, it's going to look only at the GBIF database. So if I don't give it any from, I'm getting the same thing as I should get with GBIF. If I can add any of these additional databases, and there are additional options. So I can say look at Bison, which is just a North American database, um, eBird, um, and AntWeb. And as there are more packages available that we have written the, you know, the individual package for, then they can work their way into here. And then the documentation should get updated to say, oh, here are the new, the new sources. I don't know how to scroll in this particular. There we go. So you can find out more information about the different databases that are currently supported by this one. So these packages like TaxSize and Spock are providing you a sort of a convenient wrapper around a whole bunch of other different packages. Um, if you want to go to the packages themselves, you can kind of see what's, what other things are available so by, by category, say. So. so some of these ones, like Eco Retriever, 
is not wrapped around Spock, even though some of the data it has there is the current data. Uh, EcoEngine is not in there yet, but also has a current data. So there's you kind of until they're all put into one package, you can query by that particular database, and that depends entirely on the kind of work that you're that you're doing. Whether there is already kind of the one database for all the parasite information you need, or whether you're working across something that doesn't exist yet. So these are organized by these are kind of the already some vertically integrated data. And then I haven't shown today, but you can search literature doing sort of text mining um, for patterns. And again, those right now are mostly by publisher, and there's a package currently being worked on full text, which is the, sort of the integrator for these different publishers. So yep. actually, my question is kind of related to the difference. Like a lot of times, we have ideas like, oh, it'd be cool to answer this question, but I don't, I don't know if the data exists or where it is, and then if it exists. If, and so, like, is this page kind of like the, the best integration of like what? Well, this will answer that this exists and is connected. So yeah, yeah. so this is what, what exists and is connected. Um, this focus is somewhat on a, um, an academic slant. There's a task view on CRAN, which provides kind of a more big picture view of different web technologies. So say I just want to be able to connect to, you know, X source about uh, economics or sports or something. So we can look at the task view. Uh, web technologies and services. So this is a much bigger bin than what Arv and Sai is covering here, where these are you know, mostly academic sources of databases and literature. Okay. And then so if you could, um, that's really cool, if you um, found the other, the OpenSci, yeah. and was an academic event. So let's say you know, you're kind of scrolling around and you're looking for something and you see you know, a package that might work, then is the documentation to kind of also a good question so the first question is like you want to say oh well am I looking at a package that some people have just started and maybe like there's not gonna be good documentation for or not or is it um, already been released so if it has a little light for CRAN that means it's already been released and so then I can click on that and that will take me to this CRAN page and you can see when at CRAN there's these vignettes that are gonna say here is kind of a nice readable way of how to do a particular task on this. And so it should give you some background information and then kind of walk you through some of the calls. And so you can see working with sea ice, working with storm data, and, and so forth. You also, the other sort of key website to look at, which is that first link in any of these things, is looking at what the data provider themselves are describing the data because most of this is documenting kind of on the R side. So we can say, well, what, what is RDAP? Often people will see like you're reading a paper and it says, oh, we've used RDAP data. And you say, oh, well, how did I go about getting that? So you can go to RDAP and read what they're providing here and then say, oh, well, I wish there was a way to do that in R. And you can see if there's an R up inside package for that. And then here's the package and here's the kind of walkthrough. So packages that are less act or, or less finished yet, they, we try to flag them as in early development, but you can usually tell if they haven't been released, there won't be a light on there. And so then they're just on GitHub. There's usually some basic documentation on how to get started here on the README, like install it from GitHub, here's some of the things you can do. But it's a bit less you know, ready to go yet. And do authors usually have their information as well? Do you see something that's like, looks like it's half finished and you could like to tell them and say, hey, I'm just curious, like, what? Yep. So on, on GitHub, you can always see who is um, committing to this package. There's the R file, the description file. Yeah. Then we'll have the first person listed as kind of the lead developer of that, and then contact information for them and possibly for the other authors. So that's you can you can email them directly, but usually the best way to do it is just once you found the package, just click on issues and say like, will this work for this particular thing? or I can't get the following code to work, what have I done wrong? And that's really, everyone is 
the purpose of having this up on GitHub is to kind of provide that interaction in the first place. So find the package on GitHub, click on issues, and just if nothing else, you can just say, this is my use case. Like, this is what I'm trying to do. Can your package do it yet? Or are you thinking about doing that? And you can engage the developer in that kind of dialogue. And that's exactly the kind of thing we're, we're trying to make happen more. Our website also has a chat box in the corner. Yeah, let's go there. <laughs> yeah, so at the here. Is your browser not loading or? Usually there's a little box down here. Where, uh, need help. So you can, you're, you're also welcome to like ping Twitter or there's usually a person on the other side of this. So you can just say like, hey, do you have a package for uh, NOAA sea ice data? And see what happens. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no data that's out of scope, right? The only, the, the only scope is that somebody wants to, <laughs> that somebody might, you know, that the data can be accessed. Um, so we're, we're not trying to prioritize like, oh, we're only looking at data that is global or that is particular uh, scale. So that that CI data is an R now. <laughs> At least I get to do it from your account. <laughs> and that, that it's, it's the R one side thing that maintains that ask you as well. Yeah. Um, brand for all the packages that are for interaction with online databases and like Yeah, so this is this is the very big net of you know things that you can do on the web from R. And so some of these things are you know very web focused JavaScript and some of these things are particular discipline focused like down here, earth science, various repositories, astronomy. So a lot of our R open side projects are listed down here under ecology or earth science. You see how array and some other fields. But there's some economics, some finance, some genetics, open government, there's the literature packages. So mm -hmm. most of them, if they have not yet been released, they're flagged as not yet being on prem. That's not always up to date, so some of those are now actually on prem, but that's where they're at. So yeah, lots of lots of places to look. So I would assume That's right. So I don't know a lot about the open data world in health. I mean, there's obviously a big move to figuring out how you can uh, anonymize and share that data well. But uh, right until that problem is solved and there people figure out a way to make that data shareable, if it can be shared at all, then there certainly won't be interfaces to it. So our side of the project is only providing interfaces where that data is already available. We see that happens as kind of a pretty big gap, that the, the world has been very good at getting a lot of data onto the web, but we're not taught how to use that data through graduate school. And therefore, we don't end up taking advantage of the fact that all of this data is already out there. And we work you know, on questions that we could be addressing with you know, help or assistance from other data sources as well. As what we're collecting, um, but the but the barrier is just a bit too high. You go to some website and you're like, well, I can't actually do anything with this. So there is a parallel and slowly growing organization called Our Open Health, which is essentially taking the same model for the existing public health services. And so that's you know, better point. They got like 
2004 packages or something, and they're just sort of starting off. But it's the same focus specifically for the council. I don't know if they have a study yet, but it's like, um, but yeah. You can go to helpdata.gov and see what kind of data they're actually starting to, to make available and what they're doing about the about the privacy concerns. So Food and Drug Administration recalls, for instance, that's a good example of public data. Maybe right into this, um, but let's say that for the flip side, it's like I have data, but it's not necessarily like just my study. So, well, this example, maybe okay, this example for how a lot of people have is that um, I <coughs> slog through the long hard way of using public data as far as you know, emailing the wildlife service and people, like all the data exists, mm -hmm. but it's not on a really good server and so I put on to R and deposit and made so now I have these profiles for Delta. Awesome. But I mean and I, I in my mm -hmm. paper I like published or anything, but it's like I would like that to be small. It's not my data, but it's public data. Right. So you so most of the data is public domain. Yeah. All right. And you can republish the best things to publish it to are the sites we talked about at the end. Like yeah. so uh, KNB publishes uh, Knowledge Biodiversity Index, publishes all environmental and earth science data. And so you could submit it to their database. It's now, in, KNB is part of what's called this Data One network, which includes most earth environmental science uh, databases already. And so anyone searching for anything in Data One would be able to discover it because it was in KNB. And so you would describe in that XML, by, in that XML file using that little function we looked at, the EML function. Um, where the data originally came from and what you had to do to assemble it. That's sort of your easiest way to kind of get it up online. There's a lot of people that will, or even agencies that are like, oh, we need to do this. We'll make one more new repository. And in some ways, that's less ideal because there's no interfaces that exist for it. Whereas if you put it on KNB, it's immediately part of the Data One network. And anyone that knows how to consume data or any existing tools that know how to consume that data, like, they're ready to go. There's no need to, like, Oh well, who's going to write the package for that now? So that's kind of the best way to get out there, and it's also easy to cite. So it's given a DOI that tracks the versions. If you need to change the data, I'll say like this was the original version. So the whole, all of the, the details are handled for you. Is <clears throat> KNB the default or the one you would recommend? It's the easiest to upload data. Well, it has the richest metadata. That actually makes it harder to upload data. Because you have to provide all that information. So once that little function is working, that it will now be easy for you to upload metadata. If we go right now and say uh, sign in and say upload, it'll ask me to fill out all of these extra forms. And it's like, that's tedious, right? Whereas if I go to Figshare, it'll say like drop in your file, your CSV file, you know, write your name, click upload. It's super easy. But it's less useful because someone starts to like, well, what's actually in there? So it's it's worth doing the hard part. And I sorry I didn't have that to show for you today, but we're hoping that we can make the hard part easy so that your data is both you know quick to publish but also really useful. So you need to have a account with You don't. Anyone can log it, can authenticate. You need to it needs to know who you are because you become the maintainer of the data and you have the right to then edit it. So you can if you have a Google account or a university account, you can authenticate with that. So yeah, I, that that tutorial that's is, yeah, it's not done yet, but hopefully that'll be working soon. They just redone their interface, so I, I couldn't show the Kansas integration. We can show just what their online form looks like here. You can just log on as being unaffiliated. And so right now, if you're trying to submit data, it asks you to kind of manually put in all of this information for each of the CSV files you upload. And the first time you're doing that, that's actually quite 
nice to have nice boxes instead of having to type it into R. But the you know tenth time you're doing this, you get kind of bored about like well, why don't you know my address by now? So being able to do this programmatically and take advantage of whatever R already knows about your data rather than you know having to specify it all by hand. Yeah, you can see we didn't dig through all of those things, but because they're you know worth taking a bit of time to, to click through.